corporate needs you to find the differences between this picture and this picture. They're the same picture. Bishoujo Senshi Seida Moon. Everybody knows Sailor Moon, whether you've seen it or not. It's the seminal Magical Girl series. From its Sailor School Girl aesthetic, to its magical talking cats, to its useless tuxedo mask memes, there is nothing about this franchise that is not instantly recognizable and iconic. But here's a quick rundown. Schoolgirl Tsukino Usagi fights off monster attacks from the Dark Kingdom as Sailor Moon, assisted by sailors Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, and Venus. She's in love with the dreamy and mysterious Tuxedo Mask. The girls eventually find out that in a past life, Usagi was Princess Serenity of the Moon Kingdom. They were all reborn in the modern day after a war that broke out between the Earth and Moon Kingdoms killed them all. Now they fight to prevent the same evil entity from gaining power again. Sailor Moon started as a manga series by Takeuchi Naoko in 1992, followed by a concurrently running animated version that later started adding letters to its titles like some other popular anime franchise we talk about on this channel. Then in the 21st century, the Sailor Moon manga was adapted again into a new animated series that spun off into more movies. And that's pretty much everything. I can't imagine that we're missing any important milestones or whole series. That would just be silly. Oh, right. Silly me. Yes, there was a live-action weekly Sailor Moon series retelling just the first story arc that aired in Japan from October 4th, 2003 through September 25th, 2004. It's the story you love, but updated for the early 2000s. That means we are smack dab in the middle of its 20th anniversary, but I rarely see anybody talking about it. When I posted my live-action Sailor Moon is the Distracted Boyfriend meme in a Sailor Moon Facebook group, well, it actually did far better than any social media post I've ever made in my entire life. Seriously, I wish the posts I make promoting my channel would do nearly as well. But I was still shocked by how many comments were from people who had never even heard of this show. And that was in a group specifically for Sailor Moon fans. This doesn't get nearly as much love as any other incarnation of Sailor Moon, which is a shame because, as far as I'm concerned, it deserves a hell of a lot more. When live-action adaptations like One Piece have suddenly become insanely popular, why are we still sleeping on this show? Well, you know, besides the fact that it's never been released outside of Japan, I was being rhetorical. But I include myself in that sleepy list because I had never seen this show until last October. I always knew it existed. In fact, I think I even had a poster of the cast as my desktop wallpaper when I was a teenager. I just never made the effort to watch it. Frankly, I'm always skeptical of the idea that a cartoon needs to be remade in live action. Or should. But when I realized it was the 20th anniversary, I decided the time had come to finally give it a chance. My impressions were as follows. Oh, how silly. How cheesy. Look at them trying to recreate classic moments from Sailor Moon, only not as convincingly because it's in live action. Oh, these fights look so stupid. How hilariously awkward. You know what? These characters are really starting to grow on me. Hey, I didn't expect them to take the story in that direction. That's brilliant. What is happening? How did I get so invested in this? Why am I crying so much? Something I thought would be a fun, silly thing to laugh at was very much that, but good, actually? Now that I've finished the whole series, I can easily, confidently say that this is not only worth watching, it is, by far, the best telling of this story that has ever been made. Disclaimer, I have never seen Crystal, but from what I've heard about it, I still feel pretty safe in that assertion. So, to celebrate the 20th anniversary, as well as the legacy of this undervalued, overlooked show, I am going to be devoting time this year to multiple videos on this topic, starting here, with my impassioned, hopefully persuasive primer on why you should be watching live-action Sailor Moon. Well, I think the nature of this exercise requires me to be a bit more thematically appropriate. Mercury power make up! Do we say Nicolate? 
Oshiokyo. Hey, I bought all this for New York Comic Con last year. Of course I'm going to find a way to work it into a video. Who's Ami's little tax write-off? You are. You are. So let me lay down a little bit of info. This series has the same name as literally every other incarnation of this franchise, Bishoujo Senshi Seda Moon. However, it was the first time a series came with the built-in English translation of Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon. Prior to this, if the full title was used at all in English, as opposed to just Sailor Moon, it would be translated as Pretty Soldier Sailor Moon. So while Pretty Guardian is far more pervasive now, the name stuck in the English-speaking fandom as a means of easily distinguishing this series from the others. Even now, it's fairly common to hear this referred to as PGSM. For the sake of convenience, I will as well. Given that this is a primer, I will try to avoid major spoilers specific to this version of the story. And there are surprisingly many, even if you are familiar with other versions of Sailor Moon. I'll be going deeper into the story in later videos. There will inevitably be a few spoilers here. You've been warned. However, I'm not going to avoid things that are obvious. The rude guy Usagi's always bickering with is actually the dreamy tuxedo-clad guy who's always saving Sailor Moon? Gasp! That's not a spoiler. Those are the ground rules, let's go. So why does PGSM work so well for me? I'm going to go into great detail as to why, but as I was browsing Reddit, I came across this quote that sums it up far better than I ever could. It has become my go-to stick it on the back of the DVD box review that would sell a million copies. Here we go. PGSM is like a soap opera mixed with Power Rangers directed by David Lynch. It's an LSD fueled rocket sled of entertainment and I cannot recommend it enough. If that doesn't make you want to go ahead and shut off this video to track down the series and watch it, I don't know what will. But let's keep going anyway, using that quote as our template. It's like Power Rangers. This one should be obvious. Author Takeuchi Naoko has stated she's a fan of Super Sentai. It inspired her work on Sailor Moon. Those similarities are clear in all versions of the work, from its color-coded team, to its epic posing, to its signature attacks. So naturally, when a live-action television version was created in the same country, by the same production company that makes the same Super Sentai franchise that's localized into Power Rangers, those similarities would be even more apparent. Having spent the past three years comparing Zhu Ranger to Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, I was immediately recognizing filming locations shared between Super Sentai and PGSM. And yes, that includes filming your big pyrotechnic fights at Mount Iwafune, truly the Vasquez Rocks of Japan. Even the Putty Patroller costumes from Power Rangers are reused in this series. If you are used to the production values in shows like this, if you are used to weapons looking like toys because they are most assuredly sold as toys, if you're used to believing that a few plaster statues thrown on the ground make a wholly different dimension, if you love a good rubber-suited monster, if you spent your childhood using your imagination to pretend that brightly colored costumes are in fact magical armor, you will feel right at home here. If you're expecting Marvel Studios quality production values where everything is slick and expensive and will whisk you away to magical worlds with no effort on the part of your imagination, you've come to the wrong place. What else can I tell you? You either find this style of filmmaking charming or you don't. I grew up on Power Rangers and 1940s Batman serials. Schlock is cozy to me. I don't need convincing effects to suspend my disbelief. I just need a story I can believe in. And that's good because this CG is bad. It was 2003, made for television. The signature attacks aren't going to look as good as they did in animation. There's not going to be the beautifully ethereal line work of the manga. The transformation sequences aren't going to be as flowing and acrobatic. They're going to be stiff and clunky with actors on turntables while the footage is undercranked. Well, except for Sailor Venus. Her transformation sequence is so wonderfully, incredibly, ludicrously extra compared to all the other girls. She gets yeeted straight into space, and that's just how it starts! 
Three versions of Minako strut down a catwalk only she can see. She spends an entirely inordinate amount of time reenacting every early 2000s Herbal Essences commercial. And then, to cap it all off, tiny fade gymnasts create Sailor Venus's signature hair and bow through the power of miniature rhythmic gymnastics. I just... this is amazing. This is the coolest transformation sequence I've ever seen in anything! I defy you to find a transformation sequence in all of the animated canon that even comes close to this level of majesty. She is the princess, after all. Given the long Super Sentai tradition of crafting great-looking martial arts fights week to week, you'd expect that to carry over into PGSM too, right? Right? Well, frankly, the battle sequences sometimes look like you and your friends got together at the local con and shot a fan film. The action is something I can definitely see turning people off. Fans even have a derisive nickname for it. Ballet Foo. It's a lot of spinning and leaping, movements are slow and clunky, characters often fall so gently, and that tends to break my immersion. But here's the thing, it does get better. The show shakes off its early awkwardness and starts choreographing better fights. The performers get better at selling those hits and falls. Towards the end, they even start using practical effects on occasion instead of just CG. The violence is pretty stylized, Usually battle damages no more than smudged faces with the occasional burned glove. I can't imagine how hard it was to keep these white costumes clean. But what never changes? These girls love to cartwheel. They cartwheel all the time. Even if it's far faster to walk somewhere, they will cartwheel. Drinking games are very much not my thing, but if you decided to make one out of this, you'd probably die. Compared to Sentai, where the characters wear helmets, there are fewer opportunities to use stunt doubles. Heck, according to Azama Mew, who played Sailor Jupiter, she had to do most of her stunts herself because they couldn't find a stunt performer tall enough to double for her. That's a real Sailor Jupiter problem if ever I've heard one. But the fact of the matter is, given how much animated Sailor Moon's action is just recycling the same attack sequences every episode, I don't care if this isn't always amazing. Nobody comes to Sailor Moon for the fighting, and it's refreshing to see the girls rely on regular hand-to-hand -hand combat skills at all. Before I conclude this section, let me also address that, yes, the girls don't have their signature hair colors unless they're transformed. I've seen a few people complain about this, and I just don't get why. It's one of the few concessions to reality this show makes. And that is, while it's fine as a cartoon, it probably wouldn't make a lot of sense for a Japanese middle schooler to be walking around with blue hair. Yep, you can occasionally see the lace fronts on those wigs, but again, that's the kind of show this is. The hair changes make for slightly more convincing disguises, as opposed to them all looking exactly the same except for their new outfits. As long as Usagi has her signature dumpling-shaped pigtails, which she does, I don't see what's worth getting worked up about. It's a soap opera. Again, this isn't exactly outside of Sailor Moon's wheelhouse to begin with. The franchise has always had tons of unrequited romance, pain, loss, death, shocking revelations. That's what you come to Sailor Moon for. But this is where PGSM particularly excels. Now, its first few episodes are fairly straightforward adaptations of the introductions of the characters. They just tend to not be as good because they're trying to recreate those iconic moments with their tokusatsu production values. Everything feels a little softer, a little hokier. The earliest episodes are definitely the weakest. I think a lot of the criticism comes from people who didn't make it past the first four episodes and just wrote it off there. Why would you want to watch the exact same thing, only less good? After that, though, PGSM takes off its training wheels and decides, screw it. From now on, we're going to tell this story our way. That's when it really starts to become good. So what is their way? Well, I'd argue that both the manga and the 90s animated series are primarily plot-driven, even though they execute that in very different ways. For the manga, the focus is on the dramatic reveals, the mythology, the romantic backstory, P 
peeling back the layers of exposition. For the anime, it's the Sentai-esque formula. Every week is an episodic adventure. A monster shows up connected to whatever the girls are into that week. A victim has to be saved. The Sailor Guardians do their thing. Happy days all around. The first series of animated Sailor Moon came out the same year as Yu Ranger, and the two have nearly identical episodic structures. There's nothing inherently wrong with any of that, it's just what it is. PGSM, however, is the first time the story of the Dark Kingdom is told in a way that's primarily driven by its characters. The Sailor Guardians aren't simply a collection of traits. This one's the smart one, this one's the sporty one. Every one of them has an arc. In fact, they can't fully unlock their true powers until they've confronted and overcome a character flaw specific to them. Exploring the inner lives of the characters, their friendships, their personal trials, eventually becomes a bigger focus than whatever rubber-suited monster happens to be bumbling around. On rare occasions, the rubber-suited monsters barely feature. Oh yeah, I'm contractually obligated to be Sailor Moon for at least two minutes. As early as episode 5, they do a story that's simply about painfully reclusive Ami trying to study her way into becoming a proper friend. Friendship is the main driver. This series posits that, aside from Usagi, all the Sailor Guardians are some flavor of weirdo loner until Usagi's extroverted and unconditional friendship draws them out and creates a found family. They start spending time at their hideout even when there isn't any work to do, just because it's really the only home they have. I love this idea so much. It's something I've never really seen Sailor Moon explore outside of briefly bringing it up in the Sailor Moon R movie. They really put these girls through the ringer, be it Ami's crippling levels of insecurity, to Ray's dad slapping the taste out of her mouth like she owes him money, to Minako's... well, I can't even get into her right now. She's a soap opera in and of herself. She's also a pop idol in this version. The show is really unsubtle about its emotions. There's even a sequence where Usagi has to chase Mamoru to the airport to tell him how she really feels before he leaves forever to study in London. At the University of Saintford. Again, I thought this was just going to be a cheapo toy commercial. I didn't expect to have my heart broken on a regular basis. There's almost no combination of characters that isn't played with, and they often come into conflict with each other. In particular, Rei and Minako have a competitive antagonism that lasts for most of the series. But that just makes their relationships deeper. When they do come together as friends, it really feels like it's been earned, that they have been through hell together and forged bonds that will never break. That's not too dissimilar to the actresses who played them, who are still very good friends to this day. What I really love about this show is that it explores the effects finding out about their past lives would have on the characters. That's something I've always been disappointed they accept so easily. Here, their responsibilities really start to weigh on them, and they all have different philosophies about it. For example, Minako is fully driven by her mission. Rei comes to resent it. Usagi initially breaks down, terrified this means that her mom isn't actually her mom. Usagi and Mamoru have to work out whether their love is destined to bring about disaster, and whether it's worth pursuing in light of that risk. It's good destiny versus free will stuff. Another exciting element is that all of this applies to the villains, too! The Four Heavenly Kings are such a letdown in the manga, they are introduced just to die immediately. Their backstories are revealed way too late to further them as characters. They stick around much longer in the animated series, but they are still largely functional to create the external conflict of the week. And they still primarily exist one at a time. Here, they finally get to represent the dark mirror images of the Sailor Guardians they were seemingly created to be. They were to Mamoru's Prince Endymion what the Four Guardians were to Usagi's Princess Serenity. As villains, they interact with and manipulate each other. They compete for Queen Beryl's affection. They have different goals and loyalties. Zoicite wants everyone to remember their past lives, while Kunzite just wants to burn everything down. The allegiances of heroes and villains alike are constantly shifting. Sometimes they even have to work together to further their specific agendas. Everyone has their own baggage they have to sort through. What helps tell these intertwining stories is that all of these things have consequences. After the first 10 episodes, PGSM becomes almost entirely serialized. It's not a Monster of the Week structure. 
Sometimes a monster's introduction will serve as a cliffhanger, or will hang around for multiple episodes. And that's mixed among oodles of ongoing character beats. At the same time Usagi is working through her feelings for Mamoru, Ami might be having a fight with Naru, Makoto will be hanging out with Motoki, and Rei will be chasing after the mysterious Sailor Venus. All of these things persist and develop over time, which makes them more meaningful. That also means characters aren't typically on the same page, unlike other versions where they all mostly know the same things at the same time. You practically need to keep a flowchart handy of who knows what and when. Allow me to illustrate. Here's where a few minor spoilers come in, so skip to here if you want to avoid them entirely. So at the beginning, Sailor V knows who all the other Sailor Guardians are, but they don't know who she is, even though Minako is Usagi's favorite celebrity. Likewise, Tuxedo Mask and the Sailors sometimes work together, but don't know who each other are. However, Mamoru quickly finds out Usagi is Sailor Moon when he witnesses her transform. However, he continues on as usual, not letting on that he knows, even when he interacts with Usagi. That leads to this wonderful moment where Usagi actually lets slip that she is Sailor Moon, but since Mamoru knows she's Sailor Moon but also knows she doesn't know he knows she's Sailor Moon, they both have to awkwardly pretend she didn't actually say that. Rei is the first of the group to learn that Minako is Sailor Venus, something she eventually shares with Ami and Mako, but not with Usagi. Mako figures out the tuxedo mask is Mamoru, but decides not to tell Usagi. She does punch him, though. The villains seem to know everyone's secret identity, but very rarely take advantage of that fact. About halfway through the series, Usagi finally figures out the tuxedo mask is Mamoru due to catch Rei's repetition across identities. Mistletoe can be deadly if you eat it. Mm, but it can kiss be even can be even deadlier if you eat it. Far later, Venus teams up with Zoicite to erase Usagi's memories of Mamoru, but she ultimately can't go through with it. Since there's no Hallmark card for mind violation, Venus instead gives Sailor Moon I Know Minako concert tickets, leading to this wonderful exchange. Why does Sailor Venus have Minako concert tickets? Because it's her concert, isn't it? Eh? Because they're the same person, right? Eh? I mean, I figured that out back when she was Sailor V. Because he is Batman, you moron. Eh? Very late in the series, Usagi is forced to transform in front of Naru. In the same episode, Mako is likewise forced to transform in front of Motoki. And when Motoki finds out that the girl he likes is so powerful she can literally call down lightning from above to turn her enemies into dust, does he run away like some other guy we've encountered? Of course he doesn't, because Motoki, as silly and immature as he is, is not a fragile loser. Uh, actually, it's M Mako who runs away, but that's because she's on this self-flagellating insistence of doing everything alone, and it's part of her character arc to get over that, which she finally does a few episodes later. Suffice it to say, there's a lot going on here, and I've barely scratched the surface because, you know, spoilers. But if you think you know where this story's going, you probably don't. It's a David Lynch-directed LSD rocket sled. When I describe it like I just did, it's easy to think the show's all melodrama. There is plenty of that, but that's not all it is. This isn't a dark and brooding version of Sailor Moon Aaron on the CW. It's as wacky as any other telling. Given that we tend to associate Sailor Moon with images of glamour and beauty, it's easy to forget just how over-the-top and stylized it gets with physical comedy. Its heroines are often depicted as anything but glamorous in their everyday lives. Now, obviously a live-action show could never present its cast in quite the same way, but it definitely does its best to be as stylized as possible. The emotions of the characters are real and relatable, but the world they inhabit is often day-glow pop art. Parents and teachers are over the top, the villains live in a Dutch-angled world straight out of 60s Batman. Fisheye lenses are never in short supply. There is a wonderfully camp sensibility about this show, from Usagi doing a riff on A Hard Day's Night, to Ami and Makoto pretending to be Usagi when she's missing, to the girls abusing their powers to get revenge on some bad boys, to the characters participating in not one, but two game shows. 
There's a frenetic, absurd visual style to this show that heavily reminds me of that quintessential 60s classic, The Monkees. PGSM is unapologetically insane. It's a cartoon come to life. Now, I do have to address something in particular. Even more than the hair issue, I see this as the main deal breaker that pulls people out of the show. It's one tiny thing that's apparently so controversial, so deserving of derision, proof positive in and of itself that this is a failed adaptation. And that is, wait for it, that Luna and Artemis are no longer real cats, but instead exist as stuffed animals. Like, really? Who cares? To be clear, this is not a special effect failure. These aren't plushies that are meant to be accepted as real cats. They are explicitly stuffed animals within the narrative. I'm just gonna pick up my stuffed kitty and go home. And look, I can't tell you what to like and what not to like, but it's not as if Luna and Artemis frequently act like real cats. They're primarily human perspectives coming out of cat bodies. So if that cat body is made of stuffing, how does that affect the story in any substantial way? Also, Han Keiko reprises her role as Luna from the animated series, so this is the closest to the anime the show gets. At worst, this is a nothing change. But at best, they're the best parts of the show! Yes, they are sometimes represented as CG for complex movements, and they don't look that great, and they don't really match the puppets all that well. But the puppets? I love these things! The more they have the puppets do, the more awkward and obviously fake they are, the more adorable and hilarious it becomes. How are you not entertained by this? Can you honestly tell me sticking crescent moons on real cats would have yielded anything as genius as Artemis cooking eggs? The absolute cheese of it is the point. These interactions are worth their weight in gold. And I mean that literally, as trying to track down the toys will set you back half a grand nowadays. Luna and Artemis are amazing, and I'll never understand how someone wouldn't like this. You're allowed to have bad taste, but come on. The only justification I can think of for not liking this is that it's too silly. But we're talking about Sailor Moon! Why are you even here if you don't like silliness? This is an argument about two magical talking cats who live on the moon. Not an Oliver Stone film. But I think that's what I'm most impressed by. There is never a moment that this show feels ashamed of itself. It has no shame whatsoever. It invests fully in everything that it does, be it the plush cats or endlessly long, melodramatic shots of Usagi having her heart broken to pieces. And to my shock and amazement, those two extremes never feel at odds with each other. Instead, they complement each other surprisingly well. PGSM's emotions are always on its sleeve. There is an earnestness to this material. How impressive is it that I can remain completely invested in the heartbreak of a scene even when it includes a stuffed cat with a plastic teardrop attached to his face. I am absolutely in awe of its ability to pull that off. And it really crystallized for me the kinds of fantasy worlds I tend to be drawn to. I love worlds with deep, dramatic emotions juxtaposed with irreverent silliness. It's Dragon Ball. It's Avatar The Last Airbender. That's why I fell in love with Super Lesbian Animal RPG last year. But those are all cartoons, where reality is a lot more pliable, where there's so much more leeway to drift from the literal. I was skeptical as to whether something so broad yet so sincere could be pulled off within the constraints of live action. Now, when I first saw the quote comparing this to David Lynch, I thought it was a bit hyperbolic. This is a toy commercial for children. But then it hit me. I actually had seen this accomplished in live action before, a show that was equal parts melodrama and absurdity that somehow fit together, building on each other rather than diminishing each other. It was Twin Peaks! A show about investigating the horrific murder of a teenage girl and how that affects the town in which she lived, that's also about the most ridiculous people you could ever meet. Half the time, you don't know whether you should be laughing or crying. So, yeah, this is Sailor Moon by way of David Lynch. 
Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon is Twin Peaks for the middle school set. It's Tween Peaks. We'll workshop the title. So that's the live action Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon. It's tokusatsu cheesiness. It's soap opera melodrama. It's a coming of age story with dynamic characters. It's a stuffed cat playing the tambourine. I reiterate that I did not go into this expecting to love it nearly as much as I do. I apologize to all of my friends I've been raving nonstop about this to for the past four months. But I don't care. This was an amazing experience, and you owe it to yourself to track it down if any of this sounds even remotely appealing to you. You're smart, Cookies. I'm sure you can figure it out. But honestly, it would just be amazing if this could finally get officially licensed for its 20th anniversary. Or any time, really. I would so pay money for this. Let me, let me give you my money. Anyway. Please be sure to check out my ongoing series, Dragon Ball Dissection, or, a bit closer in theme to this, my recently completed Mighty Morphin Jew Rangers series. When I come back to PGSM next month, I can finally scatter spoiler warnings to the winds. We'll be talking in depth about the characters and why I find them so incredibly compelling. If you would like to give me your money so I can in turn give them my money, I do have a Patreon with rewards like early access and a private Discord server. It really does make it possible for me to keep doing this. If you can't, and even if you can or are, please like, comment, subscribe, share, follow me on your magical girl flip phone. Special thanks to Miss Dream, Sea of Serenity, Silby, and finally Lady Zeon for the thumbnail art. I will see you next time!